When I find myself in times of trouble, Mother Mary comes to me speaking words of wisdom. Listen to fucking Slayer and Exodus. His accolades are endless, a true legend in our industry, but I think the best thing you could say about my next guest is how much heart, passion, and dedication he has for guitar, for the metal industry, and for the people in it, and the fans. Welcome to the Scandalous Podcast, Gary Holt from Slayer and Exodus. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for having me. Yeah. <laughs> and thanks for, the, thanks for the exceptional intro. <laughs> oh, good. There you go. I, yeah, I feel like I should hand you off an award now. Um, I'm going to start doing that. I'll start having awards for my guests like after that. And then you open mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> There you go. So we just have the cutest and most heartwarming win for rock and metal. The amazing 11 year old Maya on America's Got Talent representing for us rockers and metal heads. And I think you mentored her. So how did you get involved with her? How do you guys I would, meet? I wouldn't use the term mentored. She okay. just, uh, you know, I mean, Adam Jones was like, you know, she's like the biggest Tool fan, but she's also a big Slayer fan. And she, I think she did a cover of like South of Heaven or something. And I started following her and she's just become like really good friends of myself and my wife, you know, and we both flew down to like support her and her performance. It was awesome. She like killed it. I had to run in and like play guitar tech for her at rehearsal because there was a problem with the patching of her little preamp pedal that she had and they sent out an all points bulletin because no none of the stage crew knew the solution and of course you know I'll brag a little I fixed it in seconds <laughs> but I'm a gear nerd so it was easy I thought, oh, you guys are you guys got it on the wrong input boom, 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 done and uh she killed it she got better every performance you know because she did two rehearsals and live and everyone just plateaued upward you know and it was it was awesome it was fun too. Cause you know, my wife and I love the show. That's awesome. That is so cool that you guys flew down to support her. That's really awesome. That's yeah, cool. it was cool. And we had a good time, you know, but, and, you know, um, you know, got, got a firsthand look, you know, up close, you know, when I was teching, uh, the whole production and stuff, it was really cool. That's awesome. That's so fun. And I'm so impressed that you ran in there and you're like, guys, I got this. I know. Yeah, you know, like the day of the show, I re- someone like said, "Oh, they don't allow um normal T-shirts." I had to run out to Ross and buy a, a long sleeve black shirt because <laughs> I didn't come prepared for that. I didn't know there was a dress code. Oh gosh, that's I was funny. probably wearing some black craft cult something. So, I mean, sure, I was wearing something not too offensive, you know, because you know, <laughs> I know my audience and when it's not my audience and when to like tone the satanism down a little but yeah i had to like hop in an uber and run to ross and where i knew i'd find something and i did i bought a couple of options <laughs> that's funny yeah i do love that you're wearing uh your black craft culture that's cool i like that a lot yeah, kind of uh, basis of my wardrobe i'd have to say but they make great stuff and i, I love it and, you know, yeah. lots of cats and lots of satan so it's perfect <laughs> perfect yeah that would have that would have been really funny if you were wearing a kill the Kardashian and you got sat next to a Kardashian. Like, wouldn't that yeah. have been the moment? <laughs> they, they put my wife and I way up in the balcony. We were like, man, these seats suck. But no, it was actually <laughs> super cool. You know, and like they edited it out part because, you know, when she name called me, Simon turns around and he starts going, where? And he's looking. And um, they they edited that out because I, I assume that the, they couldn't find me anyway, you know, the camera. Yeah. Not that I was trying to be on TV anyway. But, you know, it would look kind of stupid if they left it in and never had a, uh, a resolution to that question. But, you know, I didn't expect that. And I tried to hide a little bit. And my wife made me stand up. So. That's funny. I love that. That's super funny. But we were um, like clearly on the prior week's episode. Where I had some people DM me on Instagram. I'm like, was that you on America's Got Talent? Yeah. Because... <laughs> This guy, one of those acts that just gets the, you know, like they're just silly and not really there to even try to win, uh, called the Stud Muffin Supreme. His family were right in front of me and they were so loud. It was like you couldn't miss where they were because they were screaming and the camera was on them. And my wife and I were sitting right behind her. It was pretty funny. That's funny. I love that. Well, continuing the funny take 
you're working on taking care of the Kardashians, but I think we have a more pe- pressing problem and that would be a Taylor Swift problem. Can we get some help with that? What, with Taylor Swift? Yes. I love Taylor Swift. Why is that all, all the hate? She's an ex- extraordinarily hard worker. She's super fucking nice to, to everybody and people hate her. She's just the biggest pop star on the earth and more power to her. I like the songs. I love pop. I listen to pop mostly in the car. You know, I don't listen to metal. I just recently started exploring my serious subscription. <laughs> Like, okay, you know, there's some heavy shit on here, but, you know, I'd rather listen to George Michael myself. Okay, good to know. So I I love women, I support women, but, um, and none of my, like, my girlfriends are really metal at all, but I will, you know, just defend my stance on it. It's great, it's fine, but the songwriting credit and, like, the depth of that just sounds really vapid to me. Like, I, I like artists like Halsey, you know, like pop artists like that. Um, and I really like them, but I just do think that a lot of her music is very glittery. Um, so you, might, you could say that, but I'd, I, I can't speak for Halsey, but I'd like to see yeah. her songwriting credits. Cause you know, Beyonce will put out a song and there's 30 fucking people on it. How can 30 people write a song all out, all gather together it's like you're not a songwriter Beyonce I mean her daughter got a songwriting credit and a Grammy because she probably like threw some fucking kindergarten rhyme on one line and like yep give her a Grammy she's now has one seventh the Grammys Prince the greatest artist that ever was or ever will be ever got but Taylor writes everything you know so I give her credit she's a songwriter and some of these other people they require massive teams of like it's like uh it's just like a, a factory of songwriting. You know, it's like who even knows who did what anymore when there's like 20 names on it. You know, that yeah. person suggested a different kick drum sample, so they get a songwriting credit. I don't know. But yeah, uh, yeah I got no hate for Taylor. I think she's you know, she's a good person on top of everything else. Not that I know her, but I mean, hey, she yeah. took all the truck drivers a hundred grand. So, you know. Beyonce, <laughs> you know, yeah. falls in your court. What are you tipping your drivers? Probably fucking nothing. I don't know. Maybe she's super generous. I think Beyonce is the most overrated talent on earth. I think she's marginally talented. Yeah. Well, you're right. She's an incredible person. She's incredibly kind. And you make a great point that she does write her own music. So that's great. Just I mean, she's a Chiefs fan. I got to hold that against her because I'm a Niners fan and the fucking Chiefs have taken me down in the last two Super Bowls I've been to. So, you know, fuck you, Travis, and fuck you, Taylor. (laughs) All right, now you got me mad at her. (laughs) That's funny. You mean like Cheesehead? Like she's a Cheesehead? Is that what you're saying? No, Kansas City Chiefs. Oh, you said Chiefs. I heard Cheese. No, I know he's the 49ers. Sorry, I just heard Cheese, and I was like, what? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. She's immediately like elevated herself to the number one Chiefs fan, and of, of, of all of all time, I get it. Yeah, just I am only continuing to say that um, I'm like my friends and I are like mid thirties, and we just have tried to get into it. We're just like, huh, this. But great person, um, and does great things in the world. So moving on. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a Swifty, but when it comes on the, you know, and trouble comes on the radio i don't change it it's all right i like it you know yeah. i like pop music always have though even back in mm-hmm. bonded by blood era you know i get be out on tour with venom and i'm drunk at the bar singing every word to madonna angel you know and cronus is shaking his head like what's wrong with this fucking guy but i've always liked pop music so you know cool. i have a I, I like a hook a, a good chorus is always good you know yeah, trouble. Trouble was a good hook. I remember that one. I'm like, oh well, that one's good. Amazing. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't own any of her records. I don't plan to. But yeah, you know, I got no hate. Most people like try to manufacture hate. You know, you see comment section. I like, you know, the big one is even with, with artists I don't like. People like, oh, it's auto tune. They wouldn't know what auto tune sounded like if it bit them in the ass. Not you can't auto tune everything. It'll sound yeah. like a fucking robot. If you make someone who can't sing, sing, you know, like, but people, if they don't like someone, they say, I saw a comment the other day, someone accusing Adele of using auto tune and she's like the greatest singer in the last fucking 30 years. 
people are fucking high. You don't know what it would sound like. <laughs> yeah, I I love the passion. It's awesome. I, I, she's my favorite. Love Adele. That's awesome. I love that. Well, starting off, um, most people talk about the early days and everyone asks what kind of kid you were growing up. I'd like to be a little different and ask you and ask you what shaped you into a metalhead. Um, I'm the youngest of six kids, you know, five boys and one girl, my sister being the oldest and all my brothers were rockers. You know, it was hard rock around the house. That's all that mattered. Every one of us, there was no variation. So I grew up at a very young age. I had access to this like really awesome record collections of my brothers, you know, so, you know, in elementary school, I was listening to all this classic hard rock, you know, from <clears throat> Montrose to Nils Lofgren and Les Dudek and Robin Trower and, you know, all the obvious stuff like Zeppelin and Sabbath. And and then in high school, you know, Ted Nugent and ACDC were king of my high school. Like they were the pinnacle. And then the, uh, all the other stuff we loved too, like Blackfoot and Molly Hatchet and Skinner, obviously. And, and, you know, and Pat Travers and all this great hard rock. And then you discover Judas Priest you know, you've already long discovered Black Sabbath, but, you know, Priest was what really turned it into more of a metal thing for me, you know? For sure. And I know you're agnostic. Are you spiritual at all? Oh, fuck no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm an atheist. I do not believe at all. I'm not agnostic. I just, you know. Okay, cool. You know, I believe, I follow the science, you know, like, you know, if you really believe in God, you believe in some horrible fucking shit and you've self-edited out the worst of the Bible because, you know, you know, modern society, you obviously, you know, you have to, you know, and I think it's ridiculous. But, you know, at the same time, I have absolute respect and tolerance for those who do believe because, I mean, you kind of have to. 90% of my whole circle of life believes you know like my parents or my mom and dad you know i'm gonna tell my mom she's a fucking you stupid or you're wrong you know it's like all i ever ask is that i'm allowed not to believe and and some people like have a problem with that you know like but you know i, I keep religion and politics off my own instagram page because it just starts a fight anyway i <laughs> i posted a meme like years ago of like it was like jesus carrying the cross and it said this kite sucks you know? <laughs> like people got fucking mad at me i was like all right you know let's just keep it the cats and guitars you know okay well i'm i'm christian and that made me laugh i was like well that's a funny meme <laughs> <laughs> it was funny you know like yeah you know like people can send me my friends will send me memes like you know based on politicians i like at the time totally making fun of them and i can still laugh at it it's like yeah. that's fucking good yeah that was hilarious yeah. and good one i'm going to share it you know with privately <laughs> for sure well i i'm glad i asked that question because i liked um you know your like tolerance and mutual respect for people that believe differently yeah you know i, I mean think... we're all humans you know like i think it's uh segregating people based on their reliefs and everything is quite often part of the plan you know to keep them separated you know fuck i'm quoting the offspring <laughs> And, you know, because it's better for the people calling the shots, you know, to not have us unite. But, you know, yeah. like, if, you know, if someone's getting married in church, I go to fucking church and I sit there and I'll bow my head. If they lead a prayer, I'm not going to sit there and be a dickhead about it. You know, like, you know, I have family that, you know, have a Easter dinner and they lead a prayer. I'm respectfully semi-participate you know i'm not yeah. thinking that but you know i'll be quiet and put my head down and all right time to eat you know <laughs> yeah for sure that's really cool it's a great great way to be it's a great way to go through life i like that so you may be the only person on the planet who learned guitar from kirk hammett you've talked about a million times but the way we look back on our lives changes all the time in our relationship to like how we think about things um so how do you look back on that time now Awesome. I mean, you know, we we met, you know, I was I already grew up like, you know, a hundred yards away from Tom hunting and but Tom and Kirk went to DeAnza High School, which was probably about five, 
seven miles away from where I went, Richmond High. Although Tom lived near Iowa where I did because he had gotten kicked out of Richmond High. And um, I met Kirk and we became immediate friends. And I don't know, one day he just said, want to learn to play guitar. And I said, fuck yeah, you know, because I always wanted to, but I'm the youngest of six. My parents had purchased pianos for my brother to take piano lessons. It ended up being a place to put family photos. You know, um, there'd be a trumpet in the closet that someone played for, you know, six months. And I think my parents didn't think I'd stick with it. And six months later, I was in Exodus. So, um, wow. you know, I owe it all to Kirk. <laughs> That's so cool. You know, the first song he taught me was some Rolling Stone song. And for some reason, I can't remember what it was. Um, maybe Wild Horses, something like that. You know, it was an acoustic song. So it could have been like that. Angie, maybe. I, I don't remember. Yeah. Well, I bet one day, like when you're in a drive through and you're about to order a taco or something, it's going to come to you at the most random time. Our brains are funny. I bet it'll maybe if I, like, if I purchase like a uh, Rolling Stones greatest hits catalog and box set and just listen to the whole thing over. It might pop into my head, but try as I might, I can't come up with it. I don't know, but I know yeah. it was the Rolling Stones. Yeah. I like I'm that. simple. You know, I hadn't learned to play yet. Yeah. That's awesome. So from what I've heard about your scene, it was all about backyard shows and limited kegs and whiskey Tell me all the things and paint a picture of the Bay Area thrash scene because I'm from Dallas and I've actually never been up to the Bay Area before, but always obsessed with all things California. Well, that stuff was way before there was ever a Bay Area thrash scene. That was just the Richmond, San Pablo, California backyard party scene. You know, like we were playing Iron Maiden covers, you know, off the first album and everybody thought they were originals, you know, because no one had heard Iron Maiden. A friend of ours bought it in an import section completely based on the artwork, you know, like, uh, this must be good. And like, and so, you know, we were like thoroughly exposed when none of our friends were. And uh, we would throw these hall parties like when I was just a roadie, um, you know, and we give them names like the Ripper and jug night and you know you pay five dollars and there'd be like 15 kegs and 10 half gallons of cheap whiskey you know people would leave there just fucking stumble out of there crash and die on the way home i don't know probably some and uh they were legendary these parties you know and then when i finally joined the band we did one on a new year's eve in uh terra hills you know in the east bay still but you know we'd never played a club yet we would play these like barbecue kegger parties in the park and stuff with other local bands you know who were usually more in that like hard rock molly hatchet vein or a little van halen one style you know and we were definitely the more metal of them you know blind illusion les claypool you know was in the band and david white from heathen was it sang and mark biederman on guitar still plays with the band you know so you know, it was a, it was fun, you know, 17 year old kid playing parties and drinking illegally and having a good old time. <laughs> Is, isn't that a sound bite right there? <laughs> yeah. And having a good old time. I love that. And I heard a really cool story about Ruthie's Inn. Apparently this angel of a lady metalhead mother figure who was just an older lady and she just created this ha haven for metalheads to come play. I um, that, remember that'd be Sandy Coffin. She she's like you know the one person old enough and had a house nearby that we could go party at. You know, so you know, um, we'd finish playing and go to her house and just wreck shit. <laughs> it was looking out of control. Animals, you know. Okay, cool. So it was an actual house to go party at, not a bar. Yeah, it was just a house. You know, like you know, half of I still lived with my parents. You know back then and uh so you know and it was nearby so all right after party fucking boom go and fucking raise hell oh there you go that's that's why you ask questions in a podcast i was like trying to google it and find cool pictures and find shows no it's just someone's house yeah i got you and shows were dangerous as hell back then do you think pits these days get off easy compared to how it no, used to be I see, some, I see some crazy shit these days but i think um these days, uh, everybody has a, a greater knowledge of surviving it. I don't know. Um, see, it was dangerous back then. It was usually dangerous 
based on the behavior of a select few, you know, that the guys who are, were part of our family, we called them the sleigh team. And, uh, you know, the late great Toby Rage would like run off the stage, head walking across people, you know, the guy was like six, four and he's stepping on people's heads. And I've seen him get, you know, 20, 25 feet out in the crowd before he missed and went down, you know, the guy was the star of the toxic waltz video shoot. Like if GoPros had existed back then, we just strapped him up because, you know, he'd do these helicopter stage dives where he just spin himself and his legs are just flailing like a helicopter blade. And, and uh, you know, those guys are nuts, you know, but they'd be on stage doing on stage security and then they'd, they take turns running out and joining the, the melee and then they get back up on stage. And if people got out of hand, they'd be fighting on stage. It was crazy. Like I've been have punches going right past me on both sides, ducking while, you know, someone's attempting to beat another guy. <laughs> it's cool. Wow. Like in good times. <laughs> I know. It's yeah. Fun. that That's what I'm asking about. I'm like, I've never been to thousands of shows. I've never seen that. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it was very punk rock, you know, because the Exodus shows at Ruthie's Inn were like the first, you know, and I don't want to hear about New York or anything else, you know, much respect and love to all my brethren from there. But the Bay Area was where the punk and crossover scene happened first. We didn't cross over so much musically, but, you know, our audience would be like a large contingent of punk people. We would go to punk shows, you know, GBH and Exploited and you know, and Fang and all, you know, and all these other shows and, and Discharge. And, uh, and so, you know, we kind of accepted each other. There was none of these, like, let's beat the shit out of the long hairs. And there was none of this like anti-Mohawk brigade on our end. You know, Toby Rage had a Mohawk about two feet tall, you know? Um, and so, you know, that whole stage diving culture happened in the Bay area first. Like when we played, New York City on the Ultimate Revenge Tour, you know, Bailoff, and he was just pandering to his audience like any good singer would, you know, and uh, he goes, you guys make the Bay Area look like shit, and they were literally, you know, I mean, this show was epic, it was legendary, but they were standing there like that, you know, there was no pit, nothing, he got so much shit when he got home, people just like, fuck you, Paul, what, they look like shit, you know, when people saw it, I mean, you know, because, uh, you know, it was still safe there, you know, and and it was dangerous in the Bay Area for sure. So, you know, you got to you can pander a little bit. Be careful how much you pander. You insult the people, you know, who got you there. <laughs> it's not a good idea. What a what a great message right there, right? Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Music is always there for you. It's for all of us outside of bands that you're in. Which songs have been there most for you in your life um which album bonded by blood you know it's like um fortunate to have been a part of it uh you know that's a legendary record and those songs still mean as much to me today as they did back then i still love playing them i mean next year is the 40th anniversary of bonded by blood so we plan on doing something to celebrate it i don't know what yet but um there's still you know historic songs that are highlights of the show and I love playing them. I'm never bored, burned out and bored on them, you know? Yeah, for sure. Um, what songs mean the most to you of bands that you haven't been in? Rainbow, it's like Richie Blackmore's our favorite guitar player, you know, Rainbow Rising, that's my Desert Island record. You know, you could even take it down to one song, just give me Stargazer and put me on a desert island and I'll listen to it until I die of old age alone eating coconuts. You know, <laughs> like Tom Hanks and Castaway without the happy ending. Yeah. Except for unlike Tom Hanks, I had Dio and Stargazer and Richie Blackmore to play on loop till I die. You know, um, pretty awesome. You know, the, those the, those records, Long Live Rock and Roll as well. You know, anything by Blackfoot, you know, those are like legendary bands that are my favorite since I was a kid. And they're still my favorite today, you know. For sure. Anything by UFO, the Shanker years, you know, classic stuff. Yeah. Um, well, and let's be funny. Um, I love to be funny. Can you throw one pop song out there that you really love? Since you know you're oh, being God. you're being kind about other genres, which is lovely. Um, let's be funny. Like, what's one pop song they're like? Oh, I love that song. Oh, you know, any of the early Madonna stuff means everything to me. I love it. 
the early Katy Perry stuff. I love that shit. You know, fucking Teenage Dream. What a great record. You know, she she literally tied Michael Jackson for most number one songs. People don't realize that because she's kind of a ridiculous person. Anybody who's ever watched American Idol, you know, it's like, God, she's just trying so hard. It's kind of cringe. But, you know, great songs. I love that shit. You know, I'll, I'll sing along with it. You know, but my hero's Prince. You know, it's the greatest artist there ever was. There'll never be another one like him. Perfect. I love that. And you are the godfather of thrash. You and a handful of other people. You guys create the genre yourself. Um, say there's like a small child that comes up to you at a show and is just so excited. And you can tell you just lit him on fire with the love for the music. Um, what are a couple albums you would tell him to pick up from the Exodus catalog? Um, I'd tell him start in the beginning and go to the end, get bonded by blood and then go get persona non grata, you know, when you're ready. <laughs> <laughs> don't go in, uh, don't go in like, you know, both feet at once. It's fucking gnarly. But, uh, you know, we, we get a lot of kids at the shows, like, you know, 10 year olds, you know, in their front row. And we always bring them up at the end of the set and throw a guitar on them, you know, and let them, you know, try their Play best to like be a little sound out of it, you know, and like, it's amazing. Like if you had asked me in, 85 if i could imagine myself in 2024 and a 16 year old kid coming up and asking me did bailoff really destroy houses you know, like, i would not have believed you you know like kids want to know that shit you know they've heard the stories you know so i guess it's my duty to like you know exaggerate make it worse <laughs> than it ever was yeah you fucking get dynamite and blow them up it's rad <laughs> yeah <laughs> get fired on and watch the police try to put it out <laughs> that's so funny i love that that um that's kind of funny that's kind of like a like santa claus or easter bunny uh, aspect to it where it's like larger in life and you're like yeah kid yeah <laughs> i mean nobody exaggerated more than paul himself you know when he passed away people would come up to me and like you know I, paul told me about this and that and i just laugh out loud because that shit never happened dude <laughs> Paul just making shit up, you know. Maybe I wouldn't tell them it never happened, but I'm laughing inside, you know, because Paul's just fucking creating his own mythos, you know. It's fucking epic. <laughs> That's funny. I've heard legend of a show instead of Day on the Green, Thrashers had Day in the Dirt. It was a legendary show with Exodus, Slayer, and Suicidal. Um, any made up really cool stories from that day? Like how much was true and how much of it was fake? You know, that was a, it was a legendary show for sure. You know, playing with our friends, you know, and Slayer and that. And, you know, it was Dan the Dirt. It was literally just a flatbed trailer for a stage. And uh, I think that was like Rick Hunolt's second gig in the band. And um, it was a lot of fun. I mean, I don't remember it all that well. I just remember hanging out and drinking beer and having a good time and beautiful day out in Berkeley. And, uh, and uh, it's one of those things, you know, there's some great photos floating around that people had taken, you know, like, but um, I don't remember it as well as I, I should. And I have a great memory for things, but I think we kind of played and I don't, th you know, it, it, the day went by really fast, primarily, um, showed up, you know, hung out, played, and then the whole thing, you know, the permit only allowed it to go you know, to late afternoon anyway, you know, it wasn't like it went into the night. And so it was time to go home and bounce out. And I, we went somewhere and partied, you know? Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. I was like, no, wait, I think it's 12. Maybe there's a live one. Um, but bonded by blood, that is a huge album, but I just kind of wanted to like revisit the albums that you were a part of and just kind of see what was going on in the band. Like, okay, well, we were really confident in our sound then, or like we were going through this and um, we worked through this or something like that. Do you like that idea? Sure. Cool. So Bonded by Blood is a huge legendary album. What did that mean to you guys? It's like your first release ever. It'll never be the same after that, right? You know, um, at the time, we didn't know where it was going to go. We were just making the music no, to us. No one else was making. And so we're going to do it ourselves. And uh, the recording of Bonded by Blood was at a studio called Prairie Sun Studios in Katati, California. And, and the place had cabins on it. And it was on like a farm. And we fucking raised hell for like two weeks, you know. Like our friends would come up on the weekend and they'd be like, 
drunken brawls and all this shit and just fucking out and out just consumption of alcohol and then we wake up the next day and continue tracking you know it was a lot of fun we wreaked such havoc on that place that we we went back to do drums for tempo the damned in 2003 we you know and um and he was worried we were going to destroy the place and i was like dude we were kids and this is fucking a long time later you know and uh he said the level of destruction we caused was so great it had to be it was it was had to be admired He's like, it was admirable what we did. And uh, this second time we were there, we left the place cleaner than we got it. <laughs> like, that's so, good. no, we're not the same people. It was spotless. It was better. Oh, <laughs> like, that's funny. We deep cleaned it when they did. You know, um, and uh, yeah, it was a good time, though. Nice. Well, I wish that would have been the new Roadhouse mu- movie instead of the one that we got. <laughs> that That sounds like a better Roadhouse movie for sure. Oh, yeah. It was epic. Yeah. So the case for heathenism, pleasures of the flesh. What about that album? Um, that album, you know, I love the songs on it. The recording was kind of fraught with some difficulties because, you know, we worked with, you know, the producer from Bonded by Blood, but Mark Whitaker, you know, is one of our oldest friends, but he had specific ideas of how he wanted to record the album that didn't blend with ours. And it led to some real technical problems. And we ended up kind of having to fix the album rather than just go in and do it how we wanted. And um, so the sound wise, I'm not happy with it. You know, it should have been exactly along the lines of fabulous disaster, but um, you know, the songs are great. You know, we're starting to incorporate more of those into the set now, but you know, it was, it was a problem we were, we were recording like at this graveyard shift at Hyde street studios because the rates were cheaper. So, you know, we're working all night and walking out at like seven in the morning and sleeping all day. And, and, you know, it's not the most conductive way to record, you know, for like, you know, rest and, and creativity, you know, I mean, a lot of bands say like that, you know, when we got the fabulous disaster, we were able to record in the day. (laughs) That's good. Well, I enjoyed listening to you talk about that. Like anyone who creates anything, we're always so hard on ourselves. So it's kind of humanizing to hear you talk about it and go like, well, you know, I really tried and it wasn't exactly what I wanted. Like, Well, you know, he wanted to trigger the drums and this is now triggering so prevalent, you know, in Pro Tools, anybody could do it. But he wanted to trigger them then and be, he was so confident in the triggering ability of this, you know, unit he was going to use for it that he didn't bother making sure the natural drum, drums sounded good. You know, we're just going to replace them anyway. Why waste any time? the triggering didn't work. Everything was mistriggering. And so Tom had to go in and replay his drums one drum at a time and fix it. So, you know, he hates it. It was a fucking nightmare, you know, when you should be going in and just going crazy on your kit and letting it fly. He had to go back and fix it all. And, you know, when Tom had to replay the drums, he still was committed to using the sampled sounds because the real drums were not... The, you know, the sound sucked because he put no effort into it, you know, so he, you know, it, it's a problematic album for us. I know, I know drummers in the Bay Area, when we did the album, they said it was their favorite drum sound. We're like, it's fucking high. <laughs> what are you fucking talking about? Super think- digital, you know, electronic. Yeah. Uh, but, um, you know, it is what it is, you know. Yeah. Well, based on stories I've heard, they could have been high. Ha ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. It could have been, maybe. And uh, most, fabulous, likely. most likely. A Fabulous Disaster, you recorded in the daytime. What yeah, that was, uh, that was recorded exactly how we would have recorded Pleasures. I mean, if not even taking into consideration the the scheduling. You know, I would have walked into fa- Pleasures and got my guitar tone like that. But Mark wanted me to use certain amps and, and trying to maybe make a you know he wanted us to use the gear metallica uses and fa- fabulous i used my gear you know my marshals and the result is crushing it's like one of my favorite records that's awesome i love it and impact is imminent i think you said in another interview has your favorite riff on it is that true yeah the title track riff it's my favorite riff i ever wrote uh, it's crushing it's like really good and we started playing that song live for the first time in 
decades just last year and uh took a while to get that riff 100 percent again you know you play it and it's 90 percent, and it has to be 100 because it's too too tough of a riff to play and um without having it perfected and uh you know that record you know got a lot of flack at the time it came out because <clears throat> i think a lot of people wanted to hear like toxic waltz part two and we came out with this album that was full of like long epics and super crushing and brutal guitar sound and and it's a lot of people hollering at me for more songs off that album now you know all right next up is force of habit force of habit was it's another album yeah like we haven't played one of those songs since that album came out and i'm contemplating bringing something back it's a great album people thought we'd like slowed down you know only probably because it's the first album the only album we ever did that starts off with like not a 100 mile an hour song but there's some of my favorite mine and rick Hunolt's favorite guitar playing is on that record it's a maybe a little more melodic you know and a little more in the other direction of impact is imminent but you know it's a fucking great album it had too many cover songs you know it didn't need you know two of them on the record you know and yeah we got the tower of power horn section to play on our rolling stones cover which sounds awesome, but does a thrash band really need the Tower of Power horn section? Probably not. We spent a fucking fortune on that record. And, um, and uh, you know, it sounds amazing. There's great songs, great hooks, but it might not be the most quintessential Exodus record. You know? um, but there's great stuff on it. I want to play something off it for the first time in ever. And you won't say... We recorded that one in it. London. You know, we shipped the whole band and all of our gear off to london for like a month we spent so much money <laughs> it was like squander now you know we'll make albums in tom's garage and it's fucking yeah. sounds awesome yeah <laughs> there you go. technology man right technology. yeah totally portable and awesome yeah will you say which songs you're considering bringing back from that album? i don't know we have to sit down as a band and discuss it you know i leave in nine days for europe so We'll start talking about the set list for the November, December headlining tour. You know, maybe we'll pull out a deep cut, you know? Cool. Nice. And Tempo of the Damned? Oh, the, the most sickest comeback album. I mean, you know, after all the absence and all the drug abuse and the shitty menial day jobs, you know, because life completely changed for, changed for them. You know, I mean, fatherhood also obviously but a lot happened in that time frame and tempo of the dam would have never happened if i hadn't got clean you know off fucking meth and um it's fucking an amazing record amazing wow just fucking hungry you know i mean we're, we're we still make the albums we do now because we're still hungry because you know we we carry an enormous chip on our shoulders you know <laughs> i don't ever want to lose it because it's what motivates me i love that that is um such an incredible way to look at that album like that that completely like changes the way you like go listen to it through yeah, just the great. I mean, inspiration you know, and the passion to bring that back that's so cool yeah i mean the chip on our shoulders like you know how many times did we got to go out with some of these other bands that get more you know more praise or more record sales how many or whatever how many times did we got to go out and just straight up crush those fools like right on the same stage and just destroy them and and uh and sometimes it doesn't go get recognized enough you know me growing up you know in the pre-internet age you know we'd go to these big rock shows and everybody knew when someone blew that fucking band off you know like including the promoters but now you know the promoters aren't even in the building they're not even watching they're just looking at the ticket sales you know and uh so you know the chip is there because but that also makes us a feared band. People don't want to play it after us. They're fucking scared because we'll make them look bad. We go out with the intention of making them look bad. <laughs> but we don't give a fuck. You know, we're still going to fucking bring it, you know, because we feel like we're still trying to earn it, you know? I love that. That's such a fun, exciting. I like listening to you. It's such a fun, exciting way to talk about it. I like it. Yeah. And just, um, Jamie Josta always talks about kind of the same thing of, you know, 
they missed out on so many opportunities because of their name and so many tours that they should have been on. And his funny saying, he's like, let a, let a caveman live. Let me on the tour. Bring me yeah, up. Yeah, right. You know, yeah. I mean, you know, so there are bands that are that have shown their bravery to like play out to us. We're, we're a fucking another breed. We're something not right in us. You know, <laughs> a fucking wired wrong. <laughs> I always have been, you know, like we just managed to like pull it together these days. Yeah, I, I get it. And I've been obsessed with that my whole life. <laughs> Ever <laughs> since I found rock and metal music, I get it. I know what you're talking about. And and I'm still obsessed with it. Still talking about it. Still going to shows. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So Shovel Headed Kill Machine. Where'd that album title come from? Uh, from our late beloved drum tech in Europe, Fozzy, his pit bull. <laughs> our former manager, had, after a tour, had stayed with him for like a couple of weeks. You know, I'm going to hang out here in Holland and, and I'm going to just fucking party and go get fucked up and, and have a good time. And so he stayed at Fozzy's house and Fozzy had these two huge pit bulls. And he described one of his dogs as head being like a shovel headed kill machine bam, there's the record. <laughs> so it was inspired by Fozzie's dog. That's funny. I like that. The atrocity exhibition. You know, the, you know, the Rob Dukes era is very dear to me, you know, like he helped bring the band into a more modern era, you know, and uh, when we did atrocity, I was listening to a lot of black metal, you know, and, uh, and there's a lot of that influence in there, you know, while, maintaining the core sound and atmosphere of Exodus, you know, and, uh, you know, it's like, you know, the album full of epics, you know, I mean, could I self edit sometimes? Sure. But who gives a fuck? That's boring. You know, right? thinking back like, Oh, I could take two minutes off this 10 minute long song, you know, a um, couple of the best descriptions I'd ever heard when we did those albums was one person in a review said we were the, had become the pink Floyd of thrash and another called us the rush of thrash. And I thought that was the most awesome compliment you could ever give a band because I love those bands. So, you know, yeah, we'd become really progressive, you know, but we're not the first, I mean, listening to Injustice for All Metallica became a total prog thrash band on that record, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I was just, I was, I've always believed in following the riff and the riff tells me the song's going to be 10 minutes long. It's going to be 10 minutes long. If I've got, too much to say i'm just gonna say it musically you know and um and let it happen as it is and i love that record it's fucking bludgeoning but you know it's also a throwback to albums when i was a kid where you're you're supposed to listen to the whole record you're not supposed to listen to one song and go and fucking go to the store or go get a bite to eat you're supposed to put on headphones dark in the room and listen to all of it and uh, same for Exhibit B, you know, that's why Exhibit B, you know, like ends, the, you know, the albums are tied together because, you know, Exhibit A starts with the ballad and Leonard Charles. No, I mean, it ends with it. It ends with it fading out, the intro. Exhibit B starts with it. So the two albums are totally linked, including the intros and outros. You know, it's like, wow. they're, it's like a bookend record. Wow. Very cool. That's awesome. What about Let There Be Blood? Fucking, you know, one of those regrets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of people give us a lot of shit for that. Why are you recording, re-recording such a classic record? It started as a attempt to pay tribute to Bailoff, you know, and like I always wanted to get different singers on every song, but you know, we've self-financed the whole thing. The band was broke. We had no money. And um we released it ourselves, not through Nuclear Blast, and and we just re-recorded the whole thing because you know it's too expensive trying to figure out how to get people involved, you know, when there's nobody like cutting the checks. So um, you know, it's like I, I wish I hadn't done it. It's the only regret I have musically. Didn't need to be done. Gotcha. See, I find all of this fascinating. <laughs> So like I've listened to so many of your interviews and I'm like, wow, okay, cool. I feel like I feel like I'm getting 
lots of lots of good stuff on here for sure. So is there anything you want to say about exhibit B, the human condition? Great. Regret. Record. Love okay. that. Okay. Good. Okay, good. Oh, yeah, I love that record. It's like the both the atrocity ex exhibition and the human condition are like two of my favorite records. I mean, you know, um, we'll probably never play the song Class Dismissed live because, you know, um, it was written through the eyes of a school shooter, but, you know, obviously it's become even worse since we did that, you know, and, and um, when the, that, as soon as that one kid, uh, there's this dude who posted the lyrics on his Facebook page to the lyrics I wrote and he was arrested for it. Wow. So, yeah, like, I guess words matter more than I ever really imagined, you know, and like, and uh, he was accused of like basically writing his own manifesto until, you know, it's one of those things that should have been taken five seconds to clear up. Right. Yeah. But the guy spent a couple of days in jail before they realized he was just Posting reprinting lyrics. some lyrics. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, it's too sensitive now, you know, like, you know, it's one of, it's my favorite song off the album, but I'll play it live. I gotcha. Good to know. Blood in, blood out. The return of Steve Souza. Yeah, unexpected to everybody, including myself. Um, that album was, it was written and, you know, it was kind of, wasn't hurried. I mean, I love the record, but, you know, I was still actively in the middle of Slayer. So, you know, like when, when Zetra rejoined the band, they were sending me vocal files while I was on tour in Europe. So, you know, I wasn't there to like guide the vocals, you know, there'd be a day delay, you know, cause I'm just trying to get my point across via email and phone calls. So, you know, it was, it was a long distance record, long distance relationship for me, you know, but, um, but the album's killer. It's awesome. And he did a great job. Awesome. Hey, um, and going back to that little kid, you know, uh, oh, yeah. me up to you at the show and you're like, start at the beginning. Don't go too fast. And when you're yeah. ready for, if you're not ready, then you got a persona yeah. non grata. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that album is such a triumph. And I feel like as a metal fan, it's, it feels like it's for you and it feels like a credit to the music that you love and it feels larger than life. To yeah. You know, we did, it was during the pandemic and we did the only thing we could do to, you know, you couldn't do anything. You had to wear a fucking mask wherever you went. Um, but we could make music. And so we decamped up to Tom's place in the mountains and, started with Tom and I and a drum set and a Marshall half stack, just like when we were 17, you know, and, uh, you know, I had a lot of songs, but we fleshed them out together that way. And we, then we imported the, all the gear for the studio and Steve Lagudi engineered it and it was all his equipment. So, um, it was all just trucked on in and we fucking uh, built the studio and recorded the whole album up there. And because of the pandemic, we spent more time on the record than we ever had. Like, you know, from from gathering with meeting with Tom and jamming was probably some point in May, and we the final mix was, I think was like in January. You know, so we had you know all this free time because you couldn't do anything. Life had ceased to exist. You know, in a lot of ways, but we could make metal. You know, and now I got a while working on the new album. I'm like, how do I fucking follow that thing up? <laughs> so it's a good, difficult task. For sure. As for you as a musician, does what's your process like? Do riffs come to you in your head when you're walking down the street? Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes for sure. Um, but sometimes I'll get an idea without a guitar and I just hum it into my phone. Um, but, you know, I got no shortage of riffs. Um, I've got thousands. You know, it's like my biggest problem is ignoring the older ones that I haven't used and go moving on to the next bright, shiny object, you know, and uh, Tom will make me go back and listen to stuff. And like, sometimes some of the best stuff are things I was completely going to ignore and pass on it. I got some other stuff, F forget that. And then we'll go back and revisit it. And it's like fucking epic, you know, prescribing horror almost wasn't on the album. And, um, and it was almost forgotten about, you know, and, and some other stuff too, but you know, because I I get real OCD on whatever my latest idea is, you know, and sure. I'm real quick to like to discard stuff that shouldn't be discarded. 
Good to know. So you make a good point. You do have like thousands and thousands and thousands of riffs and you have just the biggest, longest career out of anyone that I can imagine. Do you have just this massive collection of riffs of music, of memorabilia, of special things from tours, just everywhere? I do. I'm surrounded by it in here. Um, in spiders. Uh, um, like right here, Rick Hunel bought me this in like 1991. His name is Clarence. So <laughs> <laughs> he's made out of metal. He's a little whale, you know. Yeah. He was there when we recorded Force of Habit. He was sitting on the mixing board looking at us the whole time. Um, yeah, the you know, walls in my office are in the floor, everything's piled up with memorabilia. You know, I've got tubs, I got, you know, thousands of photos. I had to go through all of them for my book, you know, like to find photos for one. I had to use stuff that I knew who took it and could get permission. Most of them are mine, you know, because a lot of the best photos, like I have no idea who took this. And if you use it, they see it, they come back and demand money, you know. But uh, yeah, I've, I've hung on to stuff like a pack rat. Awesome. Do you mind showing us like two, three more things? Like I'm just kind of looking at those shelves back there. Do yeah. And like grabbing like a couple more things and just sure, like, what do you want to see? I don't know, like your favorites, like. I kind of want to see what's back there. Uh, let me see. Um, this guy is the best here. <laughs> Hold on. Perfect. Yeah, he's awesome. Well, let me be quiet. This is uh, one of my favorite things ever. Scare Bear. Oh, Scare Bear. You know, there's just stuff everywhere. You know, this is the original neck off my Toxic Walt Strat. I just had it repaired. I haven't put it back on the guitar. Um, and there's just shit everywhere. Very cool. What is your guitar collection like? Um, It's pretty big. Astro <laughs> like it just has to be like astronomically huge, I would imagine. No, not ast. I mean, I think I did a recent accounting of what I got, and it's about like eighty guitars. But I mean, I know guys who have hundreds. So, yeah, so, yeah, for sure. I'm running out of room though. Yeah, there you go. Uh, what are a couple of your favorite guitars that you've been playing on recently? Um, let's see. This is one of my favorites here. Wow. This is it. This is the Purple Rain, my Ode to Prince, which it also has the Prince signal insignia on the back. Yeah. Yeah, there's a whole bunch. <laughs> That's awesome. Cool. Well, I'll do offload some, actually. Ah, I mean. I mean, make it smaller now. Yeah, so I've got some Slayer questions and then some fan questions, and we'll get out of here. Switching gear to the fucking Slayer days, uh, what was it like when you got the call to join up? Well, fortunately, I was free <laughs> the day <laughs> of the show. Um, no, it's, it's going to be fun. You know, like, I, I've had to relearn a lot of this stuff. You know, it's been five years. Um, and, uh, you know, I just am approaching it, like, trying to be ready for whatever song Carrie and Tom decide they want to do. So I have to relearn all of them. Even if, you know, that we're going to only play a small small amount um, of the whole catalog that I know. I don't know the whole catalog. Um, but obviously, you know, I learned, it, learned the hits, the ones that are going to be there. You know, of course, we're going to play Angel of Death. Um, but uh, it's going to be fun. It's going to be awesome. I'm looking forward to seeing those guys again, you know, just, you know, the pandemic happened and I haven't seen anybody since then. You know, we talk, but I haven't been in the same room with a single one of them since I left for the airport after the last show. So it'll be a good wow. time. That is a long time. That's crazy. And I mean, you know, I was back on tour two months after the last Slayer show with Exodus. So, you know, I went right back to work, you know, and um, 
And then the pandemic happened and I made a record and so, you know, I stayed more active than they did. You know, I like was right back to work and, and um, so maybe the time went by a little faster for me. Yeah, for sure. Also being a fan of Slayer's music, besides just playing in the band, what do you love most about their catalog? It's awesome. You know, like um, the thing I always liked most about playing in Slayer was uh, it allowed me just to be a guitar player. I didn't have to make decisions. I didn't have to do anything, but just be prepared and go out and shred, you know, um, try to play the role of almost like guitar hero, you know, um, there's a lot of solos in the Exodus stuff. I mean, Slayer stuff, a lot of Jeff solos. So, you know, I do a song. Sometimes there's like two or three solos in one song and um, just go out and have fun. You know, they, they always just accepted me to play like me, you know, and I tried to pay homage to Jeff best I could, but, you know, at the same time being true to my own self as a guitar player and the, it always worked and we're old friends for one you know we've known each other since we were kids you know musically speaking and uh so you know that made it simple it made it a seamless integration you know filling in for jeff and while he was sick and then out after tragedy struck you know sure. i always wanted him back you know like i never wanted it to be a 10-year gig i always thought it was going to be like a two tour gig you know and then a year became two, become three, and then, you know, there's tragic passing, you know. I wanted to see Jeff, Matt. Yeah, for sure. So, wow. How do you, yeah, that's so heavy. Like, how do you go from heavy to light? Um, I'm good friends with Warren, and he told me to ask you about tossing the beer to him every night. So I want to ask you, so it's like really switching gears from something like really heartfelt and heavy to Warren. Well, you know, um, you know the, the amount of, you know, when I drank, now I drink non-alcoholic beers, but uh, when I drank, you know, um, once we were on stage with a Slayer set, there's a limited number of spots where I could like chill and, and really take a drink because it's such a furious set. And there were certain times when Lord, Warren would hand me a beer and uh, I don't have time to really hand it to him. And I just throw it to him. And like Randy Blythe actually captured it perfectly on photo one day. It's a beer bottle flying through the air, crystal clear shot and the beer spilling out. And all you see on the right side of the photo is Warren's hand out there ready to catch it. <laughs> but you know, like I'm 20 feet away. I don't have time. We're about to start the song here. Take the beer. I gotta go. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. Yeah. I, I've, I've had some versions of that with Warren as well. Definitely drinking with him and throwing alcohol at him. I'm for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's funny. So let's talk some fan questions, um, from Gary Holt guitar rig on Instagram. I'm sure you guys talk all the time. Yeah. Said, yeah. <laughs> he said, going to pull out any divine intervention songs on the upcoming Slayer show since it's the 30th anniversary of that album. I have no idea what songs are on that record. Let's see here. Let me look here. You're my artist. Because uh, it's two bands on earth. I have their entire catalog on my phone Slayer and Exus. <laughs> and that's it. Um, yeah, we might be playing one off that album. <laughs> okay. Ooh, exciting. I'm not saying shit. Yeah. yeah. But I, I like the enthusiasm in your voice and the way your eyes went a little wild. Like that was that was exciting. <laughs> no, it's gonna be good. That's awesome. And he also wanted to know if you're going to be pulling out any deep cuts like Nan King um on the next tour. I have no idea. I don't know the set yet. So I'm okay. learning every if I've ever played it, I'm practicing it. Okay. You know, so like, all right, let's do that one. And if it's something new. I've never played. I hope they tell me soon. <laughs> so I learn. Awesome. So my friend, Matt, he's the stage manager of the factory in Deep Ellum. And he also does like a million other things in the music industry. Um, so big guy in the industry, huge fan of you. Um, kind of a funny thing. I don't know if you like the whole big four thing or not. I don't know if you get off on that or not. Like some people do, but what are your picks for the new top four? Um. It's I'm going to stick with veterans. I'm going to say, you know, obviously myself, Exodus, you know, mm -hmm. you can't, you can't touch because we'll smoke anybody. It doesn't matter. 
Um, I'm going to have to testament, obviously. You know, they've sold fucking a ton of records and their catalog is super, super solid. Like fucking, and they're still making amazing shit. Um, Overkill. Gotta say, my boy's in Overkill. You know, so obviously there's a theme here. I'm sticking with the old guys. And then, um, you know, then I'm hard pressed. I've always been one, like whenever people would ask me in interviews, like, what do you think about big four, big five, or do you think you've been omitted? And I always say, what about the Germans? Why are they not getting the love they deserve? You know, like creator, creator and destruction and Sodom and, you know, tankard, you know? Um, so for that fourth slot, it's a toss up, whether it's destruction or creator for me. I don't know. I mean, my love for destruction goes back to like, in the bonded by blood era, you know, when Bailoff and I first heard him. And then the first time we met the guys, you know, and Mille and creative super old friends of ours and they're a legendary band and they've blown up late in life and got quite huge. So maybe we have to make it them share that spot, destruction and creator. There you go. Good. Well, but then again, wait, wait, power trips. man. So maybe we got to put power trip there. We got to put some young blood municipal waste see now we're getting past four we're into like a big seven you know like <laughs> municipal waste deserved their slot you know they they were in that new breed but now they're you know they're not new anymore they're veterans you know um they deserve to be there too yeah for sure actually i forgot who told me that um nick from municipal waste is the one that told me about day in the dirt i hit him up and i was like hey Give me something fun. And he actually told me that one. That one came from him. So those guys are my brothers. You know, they're one of those, that small list of bands that I would be okay with if I never toured with anybody other than those bands, you know, the, like my favorite people. It's always fun. Municipal Waste, Goat Whore, Power Trip, <clears throat> just total blast to tour with Death Angel, you know, and others too. Yeah, for sure. And another question. Oh, you got to put Death Angel on that list too. See, what? Big Four. You know the new Big, big Ten. Four. <laughs> now, all right, we're gonna say Exodus, Testament, Overkill, and Death Angel. There we go. There it is. Veterans, all four. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. Okay. Uh, also, Matt wanted to know: Are you vegan? No, I was for a little bit. I I, I dabbled in it, but um, man's got to be happy. <laughs> <laughs> it did inspire me to eat better though that's funny well good I still, go. I still buy some vegan stuff in. gotcha good to know did you find any good vegan spots on tour i'm sorry did you find any like, yeah, yeah occasionally you know i had my little happy cow app that i would look for like food and and uh find stuff to eat you know and like and, you know, but, you know, eating vegan is just as fattening and bad for you as anything else. You know, you can, a, a vegan cheesesteak is just as bad for you as a real one. You know, mm -hmm. like a, yeah, lots of whole idea, I guess, is to eat vegetables. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, uh, this is my last question for you. It's a crazy world out there. If metalheads could band together and accomplish one thing, what should it be? If metalheads could, band together and accomplish one thing um i don't know world dominance it's like fucking put an end to like mumble rap and wop and all that shit and let's fucking take over the top spot let's make rock and metal great again